clash and tug of war here, especially going into the close. Those who want to take the market higher, even if it's a bear market bounce, and those who say we haven't gone down hard and fast enough to really justify where we are. Yeah, well, you know, the first three and a half, four months of this year, the decline was because of the rise in interest rates. The recent weakness is uh, what I call the numerator, and that is earnings, because in the price of stocks is earnings over interest rates. And, uh, you know, we've had that rise from the Fed, um, and now there is, for the first time, concern about that earnings. And, um, by the way, uh, earlier today, uh, you know, I look at the money supply as a very important indicator. We had, uh, at 1 o'clock announcement today, the second largest monthly decline in the money supply in more than 60 years. Wow. You talk about contraction. I mean, you know, uh, you know, the big mistake of the Fed was 2020 when they pushed too much money in and 2021. We don't want to make too much of a mistake. Are they going to try to just take it all away in 2022? I'm, I'm beginning to get a bit concerned about overreaction. And maybe oh. some of the weakness we see in the economy is because, uh, you know, the, the Fed is withdrawing liquidity perhaps a bit too quickly. Oh, uh, I think they could go. I mean, Professor, right. you've been the loudest person on the network over the last couple of months yeah. saying the Fed needs to do more. Now you're telling me they're doing too much. They just got started. Uh, I know. I Well, first of all, their talk of what they're going to do, we see now that has tightened the markets, you know, bringing, in the, you know, the long bond over three, bringing mortgage rates over 5%. I mean, you saw home sales today, Scott. I mean, you, you take a look at some of these monthly reports. I mean, a snap is that a warning? It, it's what we're seeing from the retail is a warning. Now, listen, they, they definitely have to move up 50 um, but their July meeting, and I would just recommend that they, you know, and they, if they would look at the money supply, they wouldn't be in the position they are today back in 2020 and 2021. Are they going to say, oh, we're going to get the money supply all the way back down? You are for sure going to have a recession and a bad one in 2020, uh, 2023. You know, my, my feeling is that maybe there's a lot of inflation in the pipeline. Listen, they can't do a lot about it. That's all really because of the liquidity they put in. It's not like steering a wheel in a car. Oh, well, just turn this lever, inflation goes down to 2%. No. Um, maybe they should accept the inflation in the, in the, in the pipeline, go, e go easier, get us back down to the 2 to 3% long term that they want. But, uh, you know, right now, as I said, I mean, that was a pretty – Shocking statistics for me because, you know, I based all my inflation forecasts uh, two years yeah. ago and a year ago on this money supply. I had never thought that I was going to see it decline. Wow. So pulling money out of the system at the same time that the economy may be weakening faster than people initially thought. You mentioned the home sales report. I mean, manufacturing miss, services miss, composite PMI miss, Richmond miss, your new home sales miss, month over month miss. But let me read you this. This is from Bill Ackman today on Twitter, Professor, in terms of what he thinks would stop what he calls the, the market spiral. What would, what would end it? It ends, he says, quote, when the Fed puts a line in the sand on inflation and says it will do whatever it takes and then demonstrates it is serious by immediately raising rates to neutral and committing to continue to raise rates until the inflation genie is back in the bottle. Stocks of real businesses are cheap once again. Markets will soar once investors can be confident that the days of runaway inflation are over. Let's hope the Fed gets it right. I hear you saying to people like Bill Ackman that is way too much from the Fed and now you're worried that they're going to overdo it. Well, I'm just saying that they got to keep their eyes on two things. One is the, is the interest rate, and the other is the supply of liquidity. Uh, you know, don't forget, we moved from unbelievable fiscal stimulus to a situation, the big, you know, biggest one-year reduction that we had since World War II in, in the budget deficit. There's no stimulus coming from anywhere with restriction. You know, th there's a question. Let's, the, the, a lot of that inflation is in the pipeline. You know, you want to absolutely crush the economy to get rid of it right away or say, I'm going to let some of it just move through in, in my thought of getting back to the path. The past mistakes of the Fed, we're paying for those. And uh, the only way they can f fix it 
you know, immediately is a cause one of the, uh, an extremely severe recession. My, my feeling is, listen, that, you know, I've been saying go to neutral, uh, you know, that they've been too slow. I'm just saying mm -hmm. they've got to look at money as well as interest rates. They never talked about money. Had they talked about money in 2021, we would not be in this situation today. Hey, Professor, bear with me for two seconds. I want to show everybody shares of Nordstrom, uh, which was reporting earnings and the stock is soaring. Uh, there it is by 17 percent. You talk about a closely watched earnings report at this particular time, given Abercrombie is down 29 percent today. And there's so much yep. focus lately, folks, on retail. And maybe each story is going to turn out to be a little bit different based on how each of the management teams are dealing with the environment and how shoppers are different depending on which store you look at. You saw inventories up massively at Abercrombie and Fitch up 45 percent, Target up 43, Walmart up 24, Kohl's up 40. Now, I promise you, as I always do, we're going to get the color inside this report. Courtney Reagan, our expert, is doing that, and she's going to come on and let you know exactly what the story is for why shares are popping 19 percent as we're having this conversation. And, Professor, it leads me back into you to talk about the consumer. Maybe we're overreading we see one report, we say, oh, the consumer's weakening. Then we see another report like this, and we say, no, maybe they're not weakening at all. They're just being selective about where they're spending their money, and you have to have the right mix of stuff, and you have to have the right amount of stuff back in the storeroom, not overflowing to the rafters. Well, I think that both are, are important. I mean, listen, we all admit, you know, what's happening with, with gasoline prices is hurting the consumer. Um, I'm more very worried about this winter because I see what's happening to natural gas prices, the main, main source of heating, another shock to the consumer. There's no fiscal stimulus. Yes, we had way too much in 2020 and 2021, but now what are we going to do? Just say, all right, we're going to reverse all that, throw us in a recession and stop the inflation, or yeah, you know, there's inflation in the pipeline. We're going to get ourselves down to a sustainable path and let that pass through. Don't forget the official statistics on inflation are very mm -hmm. lagged. We know that about housing. We know that there was a lot more inflation in housing than the official statistics show. So we're going to have that dribble of housing inflation that's going to go through for the next two or three years. And so if they really want to stop the, the CPI statistics inflation, they will have to go to a deflation now. And that would be tragic. Yeah. So they got to recognize the reality, they've made some bad mistakes. Are you gonna turn 180 and slam the economy? Now, I'm not saying they're doing wrong. They've gotta start moving up. They were way late on all these things. I'm just saying, keep an eye on, don't panic and overdo it. Yeah, lower markdowns. I'm, I'm just speaking about uh, Nordstrom before I ask you another question, Professor, just because we're showing everybody at least a little bit of, of the color here. Uh, lower markdowns, uh, so they're being able to deal. Now, I'm not naive to the fact either that Nordstrom has a, uh, uh, a, higher, uh, a, a higher clientele, uh, if you will, not towards the lower end of the retail spectrum, right. uh, obviously, like a, a Walmart does, and maybe that's playing a role. Courtney, uh, Reagan, you've gone through the release, or at least you're going through it. Uh, what's the story here? Yep. Yeah, Scott. So obviously the um, the shares are jumping here in reaction. Nordstrom is reporting a slightly larger than expected adjusted loss of six cents. The street was expecting five cents, but the revenues much stronger than expected. Three point five six nine billion. The street was looking for three point two eight billion. So that's up about 19 percent total. The Nordstrom full line stores, those sales were up more than 23 percent. And the Nordstrom rack, that's the off price segment. Those are up 10 percent. They're, say, they're calling out sequential improvement, getting towards pre-pandemic levels. And that's a key area that analysts are focusing on because that had been a weak spot recently. As you mentioned, merchandise margins improved. Listen to this as the company says, as a result of favorable pricing impacts and lower markdown rates. This company looks like they handled the supply chain issues well, and they're looking forward actually for their earnings above the street's expectations. So for full year earnings, they're looking at 320 to 350 and the street was only looking for 313 and then president pete nordstrom has an interesting quote here he says looking ahead we're committed to driving additional merchandise margin improvement and increasing supply chain productivity 
to deliver incremental profitability. I mean, that is pretty fabulous stuff when you've seen so many of these big box stores really struggle to figure out how to manage these cost pressures that were really coming at them, that were external pressures. And then they're talking about um, strong apparel sales, shoe, designer, the strongest growth since last year, uh, when you're looking at last year with consumers refreshing their wardrobe to go back to events occasion and back to work. It looks like Nordstrom is in business this quarter, Scott. That, that's for sure. Uh, the stock certainly is. Uh, Courtney, thank you. We'll hear from you again this hour. Uh, if you find out anything more regarding this earnings report, stock, as we said, is surging. Professor, I want to bring it back to you before I welcome in some other guests to continue the conversation. And, and that's about the market specifically. Just to give everybody and you an idea of how bad it's been of late. And this from Bespoke at 21 minutes after three today. The number of times the S&P 500 has traded in positive territory for the entire session over the last 100 trading days is the fewest since May of 2009. So that leads me into a question to you as to whether you think that we are at a bottom, close to a bottom. You've seen a lot of markets over your years, Professor. We haven't had that capitulation event. The VIX go to 40 or beyond, as some people are saying you have to have. What do you think? You don't have to have it. You usually have it. I mean, one thing about the stock market, I don't think there's anything where you have to have something to call the bottom. I think we're at, I think we're still within 5% of the bottom. I still think earnings are going to come in well. And you're perfectly right. I mean, think about who is being hurt from this inflation. Lower income people where gasoline is so much more uh, important. And also, look at one third of Americans rent their homes. Rental prices, rental costs are up 20%. If you own your home, my God, you have bonanza. We all know home prices are up 20, 30, 40%. Home equity is fine. So look at the type of people that are really being hurt. It's the mm -hmm. lower third, lower quarter, lower third of, of, the, uh, of, of the entire income bracket. That includes 80 million people. And uh, you know, you're right, Walmart, Target, they're serving those. Those people are really hurting. And that's why inflation is, is sometimes called the cruelest tax of all because it really yeah. hurts the poor the most. No and, and then we're seeing much higher clientele, yeah. Walmart target, lower clientele. Yeah, uh, we're not naive to that in any way uh, and sympathetic, obviously, to what everybody is going through in terms of the prices that we've seen at the pump and everywhere else. As I said, let's uh, expand the conversation if we could. Bring in Joe Terranova from Virtus Investment Partners, Eugene Profit from Profit Investments. It's great to have both of you here. Eugene, let me get your reaction first. You are a Nordstrom shareholder. So what do you think off of what you've seen so far? Well, I've stopped pulling my breath, Scott. I think mm. that I bought Nordstrom about three quarters ago, and um, they had missed the previous three quarters until the first quarter they came out swinging. They were a very poor performer during the pandemic. I thought that it was going to be a factor of whether or not they had kept the pricing high enough and it kept this business in line. That seems to be what they were able to do. They've been able to get their online strategy in place and have the things in stock that customers want. But um, I was actually advocating for putting a put under the stock to put an earnings announce just to make certain um, so you wouldn't get decimated um, if, in fact, the margins press. Um, I'm glad they didn't. Um, they're yeah. down 10% for the year. Um, but this is a stock 6.6 .6 PE that you had a 3.7% dividend yield in, and you could have bought that um, at the start of the day. So there are some stocks out there that are performing, but I definitely would buy insurance on them. Yeah, I, I can understand the nerves you must have had, too, uh, going into this number. You take a look at some of those retail stocks uh, of late and, and today, as I said, Abercrombie down 29%. And you see that going into an earnings print. You're like, oh, I hope they deliver. So w what's your take, Joe? Uh, Joe Terranova, as I said, who's here with me at Post 9. Well, well, where we are now, what, what I said was kind of like a tug of war feel today. Are we going to have this continuation of a bounce or are we going to give it all back deja vu? Uh, re real quick, when all else fails, authorize a $500 million buyback program. That's what Nordstrom did, and, and that's basically what companies are doing right now. But listen, we, you have dramatic bifurcation in the market right now, and a lot of it has to do with the exacerbation of this condition in which liquidity conditions continue to deteriorate. And the professor spoke at length about that, and I think it's very important to understand the effect of that on the way risk assets are pricing. Think about the effect of liquidity 
in terms of on a Sunday afternoon when liquidity is injected into the market, you basically open every door to the stadium. You let 80,000 people in as fast as you possibly can. When liquidity is removed, you close all the doors except one. And that's exactly what is going on right now. The reason why markets keep... I thought you were, trying, I thought you were going to describe trying to get out of MetLife Stadium <laughs> after a game. When markets keep rallying and failing, because the magnitude in terms of the position size that correlated with hyper-growth equities mm -hmm. and the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet growing to $9 trillion is massive. There is no way that we have seen the leverage and excessive speculation in that component of the market been completely liquidated. And it's the reason why, it, you know, I keep trying to get people I'm advocating for, Merck, healthcare companies, Coke, yeah. Pepsi. That's what you want well, to own right too. now. I mean, you've been Ener energy, for that. energy as well. But yeah. Scott, the li the liquidity deterioration. We are in a process where we're liquidating those hyper growth stocks, and we are nowhere near completing that process. Oh, see, okay, so uh, Eugene, I want you to react to what Joe just said. Then we are nowhere near that the end of that process. I want to ask you. I mean, the Nasdaq has obviously been the epicenter of this downdraft that we've all been experiencing. Do, do you also feel as though the NASDAQ, let's speak about the NASDAQ specifically for a moment since Joe was talking about growth, uh, that that has a lot further to go down before it settles? Um, not necessarily. I think actually the S&P and the Dow probably will come down more than the NASDAQ. Uh, you have the largest NASDAQ companies um, still trading above bear market territory, but most of those companies have um, earnings. A lot of decimation is already in place. I think, Scott, the biggest risk in the market is what the professor pointed out, and which is um, the macroeconomic condition of interest rates and liquidity being taken out of the market at a very rapid pace. I mean, that housing number today um, was pretty scary. And um, I think that you still can buy um, NASDAQ companies, but definitely stay with the quality companies that growth rates are sustainable. And even if the growth is reduced and the earnings are reduced, um, if they're market multiples, they still are trading at a much lower premium to the market than they have been over the past three to five years. And my intention is to buy securities that are going to survive through the bear market or this downturn and be there on the next over the next three to five years when we come out of it. And the day-to-day -day mechanisms, I'm able to kind of sleep a little bit better, but some of the riskier stocks, as I said, you probably want to put some portfolio insurance around your portfolio to get through this period. Yeah, and I think people are doing that. Professor, to you, uh, on the NASDAQ as well, do you feel like it's come down enough, or is that part of the market still overvalued? Well, first of all, this is absolutely not a 2000 situation, and some people say, oh my God, we all know NASDAQ went down 80%, so it's down 32%. It may have another five, six, seven percent. It's still an over 20 PE based on next 12 months, while every other market actually in the world is in the teens right now. So, you know, if, if you know, I, I still think the shift in psychology is away from high PE, higher PE stocks. And certainly, uh, as you, we see even today, again and again and again, uh, those that were based on revenue and not on earnings. I, I still think we're going to have the value stocks outperform the so-called growth stocks over the next six months, as they certainly have over the, over the last six months. Hmm. Last question to you, Joe. Uh, I just saw a stat before the show started uh, on energy. S&P energy sector is now closing in on 5%, hmm. all right? It was 2% in November of 2020. Gives you an idea of how much money has flowed to that part of the market. Is that in danger of getting hit? As that last sort of sector that people have talked about that they haven't come for yet, and you're not gonna get that bottom until they take energy out. Because you've advocated for so, energy. You yes. keep buying energy stocks. I, I, I do, and in, in Joe T, we hold a 6% weighting towards energy. So my, my response to that would be, I, I don't know tomorrow morning, and I hope that there's a, a favorable resolution between Russia and Ukraine. And if there is, energy is coming down. So from a risk management perspective, in terms of allocating towards energy, you're at the ceiling. Where do I want to go? I want to follow the path that the professor just spoke about, which is going towards other value sectors, mm -hmm. healthcare, 
financials, select materials, growth at a reasonable price, I would even include in there as well. So I, I, I think it's more of a reallocation that's the right way to uh, think about the strategic perspective. All right, good stuff. I appreciate you being here. That's Joe Terranova, Eugene Profit. My thanks to you as well. And of course, the professor, I know that we'll talk to you again soon in the days and weeks ahead. Professor Jeremy Siegel at the Wharton School. Up next, we're breaking down the snap.